Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the extraordinary privilege of being the president of the phenomenal Hunter College, home of the great Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. And on behalf of the Jonathan Fanson director of Roosevelt House, the wonderful Harold Holzer, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you tonight to hear about an extraordinary new memoir and a really impactful piece of literature by Manal Al-Sharif um, and interviewed by one of the great stars of New York City, Fatima Shama, who is uh, now herself a leader in the nonprofit world but has made such an impact in immigration in New York. Um, as a public college, we are very grateful for the, our friends in the community that make so much happen in this transformative institution. And tonight, I just want to ask all of you to join me in a great round of applause for Tony Stepanski, a member of the Roosevelt House Board who has sponsored this and many other programs at Roosevelt House. Thank you. So you will, Minal is an extraordinary phenomenon, um, but every phenomenon needs a discoverer. So tonight, to introduce this wonderful program is a man who has discovered so much and made so much happen in the literary world as the president for 25 years of Random House and in the world of human rights as its founder, the wonderful Bob Bernstein. So Bob. Um, I'm, I'm almost ready. You can make your way because I'm going to, I have to make, I was going to stop there, but then a very wonderful thing happened. Um, it's important to remember that as wonderful as Bob is, there is a secret weapon behind him, and that is the wonderful Helen Bernstein. And as an guest, but as an indication of how wonderful Helen is, of, this is, of course, the house that is famous for many reasons. One is the fact that Eleanor Roosevelt lived here, of course, with her mother-in-law. So there are no ends, of course, to mother-in-law jokes. But how amazing it is that the extraordinary daughter-in-law, Amy Bernstein, of Helen Bernstein, is so close to her extraordinary mother-in-law that she bought her a dress and they're both wearing them tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so Amy, I would never bring this up, but it had to be said in a house that sometimes is spooked by the concept of the evil mother-in-law. And as a somewhat recent mother-in-law myself, I'm always trying to grapple with that. So to see the two beautiful Bernstein women who are the secrets behind the success of the family looking beautifully and matched, I think, it's, I think it is worth celebrating happy mother and daughter-in-laws as we celebrate this Roosevelt House program and introduce the wonderful Bob Bernstein to welcome our program. Thank you for the introduction. When I was younger, I thought I was modest, but now I've found there's no amount of praise I can't absorb. <laughs> thank you, President. I'm gonna, thank you, President Rab. You've done many wonderful things to make Hunter College the important center of learning that it is today. One example has been building the proper programming of Roosevelt House. Roosevelt House is a place where so many powers of the human mind have been displayed. In some cases, this space has been like a spark that lights a fire, and I think that tonight is such a night. I'm deeply moved to be here to introduce Manal Al-Sharif. As you will quickly find out when you hear her, and I hope read her extraordinary book, Daring to Drive, you will see that she is a woman of many parts, intelligence, enormous courage, moral clarity, and a compassion for those she has for the moment left behind in Saudi Arabia. Daring to Drive is one of those rare books that may actually bring change. One of the main ways human rights groups try to influence governments is to shame them. You know I have the wrong copy of the speech here. I do. I cut it. I <laughs> no, I did. It's all right. Daring to Drive is one of those rare books that may actually, one of the main ways human rights groups try to influence governments is to shame them. 
the Saudi Arabia monarchy stands as one of the most cruel and ruthless governments in the world today. That said, I'm sure there are many Saudi citizens waiting to change or bring change, particularly the status of women. Manal is one of them, and the Arabic translation of this book, which is underway, should help. It was a strange moment watching our president arrive in Saudi Arabia <laughs> and seeing him walk down the elaborate red carpet with King Salman, followed by a large group of Saudi men in white and behind them American men in dark suits. And then at the very pack, perhaps the only woman, President Trump's wife Melania in her black pants suit. Her husband, our president, and his secretary of state questioned, had declared that it was no longer the responsibility of the United States to question how those in other countries live or govern. At the same time, Nikki Haley, the US representative to the UN, has spoken out sharply criticizing the Saudis for their abuse of human rights. Democracy sometimes moves in strange ways. I have sent Ambassador Haley a copy of Manel's book. Obviously, many other US officials need to read it. <laughs> Manel's fight is not over, certainly not securing equal rights for women in her country, and very importantly, in trying to get the right to be united with her son, Abudi, now being raised by Manel's ex-mother-in-law and forbidden from traveling. She wrote about this so eloquently in the New York Times this weekend. It is an honor to have been asked to set the stage for this extraordinary woman in her conversation with Fatima Shama. In addition to serving as a direct executive director of the Fresh Air Fund, Fatima teaches at Hunter and Macaulay and has a reputation of a really wonderful interviewer. She has recently imbued Nobel Prize winner sharing a body in this same hall. So please begin. Thank you so much. Um, so the way this is gonna work is we're gonna have a conversation and we're inviting you to be a part of it. Um, I have a series of questions. I too have read um, Manel's extraordinary book and um, will encourage you all to get your own copy at the end. Um, and her piece that was in the New York Times this weekend. Um, but we're gonna have a conversation. We've had the chance to actually speak a little. Uh, and then we're gonna invite you to ask um, some questions. And um, so, so why don't we start with um, your book takes us on a journey, Manel, of your life um, growing up in Saudi Arabia as a girl and then as a woman um, and all of the experiences in that. So your mother plays a significant role in the book and in your life as a woman who cared a great deal about your education. Your father plays a role in the book um, and in your life as a provider. Um, as a guardian. As a guardian, you'll tell us more um, in, in many ways. Um, but I think I'd like us to start there. Why don't you talk a little bit about growing up in Mecca, in the birthplace of Islam in Saudi Arabia? So when you're born in the birthplace of Islam, there is a lot of responsibilities that comes with that because you, they look at you, the whole Muslim world, the 1.6 billion Muslims as a role model. You're Muslim yourself. Oh. So, you, so whatever things that apply to us as, 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 as Saudi Muslim women, is the one that represents the true Islam in the birthplace of Islam. So with that comes a lot of responsibilities and with that comes this care for the image of the country to be the euphoria on behalf of the Muslim world. This is Saudi Arabia, the, the protector of the two holy mosques or the, the king we call him, the custodian of the two holy mosques, which is the two holiest uh, places for Muslims around the world. With that comes the strict interpretation of the Islamic laws. And it shows clearly when it comes in their control of women. The more there's control of women, the more they grip on women, the more they show 
their control of society. And this is where I was brought up in the holy city for Muslims, Mecca, where these rules applied and it was really uh, clear applied. That was the year 79, that's the year we call it of uh, Juhayman or the year of trouble. When the uprise of the radical Islam happened, the Sunni radical Islam happened in Saudi Arabia and the rise of the Shia radical Islam happened in Iran and the clashes between both. We had the petrol dollars, we had the money, we had the power, we had the allies, the Western allies, and that created the world you see today. But talk, let's talk a little bit about your childhood, right? Um, Manal, so I'm Muslim, I was born and raised in New York, um, raised in a, a richly um, diverse, fabulous city, and as I read Manal's book, I had sort of mouth agape on oh, these are the problems. This is where the problems come from, right? But I want you to tell a little bit about going to school as a young girl, um, the reality of the role your father played or had to play um, you as a woman or as a girl and the difference that that has realized for you different than for your brother. Let's start there a little bit about um, your childhood because we're gonna go through how you've turned to become an activist but it starts as a girl. Mom believed in education. She never made it beyond fourth grade because of her father. She, uh, she was born and she lived in Egypt where the schools are mixed. Her dad was also conservative and he didn't believe that girls can study in the same classroom with boys. She never forgave him. And I remember mom, she always remembered that two things I would not forgive my dad for, uh, depriving me from education and depriving me from my child which is the, the similarities between my story and mom's story that I'm also deprived from my child now. And she insisted that we go to school. She made sure that we get our vaccination because you needed to go to school. And my mom's funeral last year, um, the principal of the primary school of my brother came to mom's funeral. And uh, uh, when he gave his condolences to my brother, he told him, you had a great father. She came to the school as a woman. A woman cannot go to boys' schools. Mom, she went there every day, standing by the school door because she wanted to register her son, my brother, in the school. And they send her back. They ask to send my father because she's a woman. But she insisted. And I was with mom. I remember those days. My brother broke in tears. This is how important it was for mom, our education, growing up. Um, you tell us in the book and you share a little bit about your religious journey. Um, and you just set the stage, raised in Mecca, going to school in Mecca, the landscape. You had your own religious experience while you were going through your adolescence. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? So again, going back to 79, Saudi Arabia was going toward modernization. The 79, the, the uprise that happened with the uh, Muslims, uh, the, the militia or the, the, the jihadis, or the Jehman, siege of Mecca. There's a beautiful book called The Siege of Mecca. I never understood it because Saudis wouldn't talk about it. It was erased from our history books. It made me understand why Saudi Arabia it was going forward and suddenly it went backward. When that happened, the siege happened, they uh, blocked the Holy Mosque gates. There were 120,000 pilgrims came to Mecca to perform Hajj. They were locked there. The king was in, he was astonished, like what's happening? Why this is happening? They're our own sons, Muslims, Saudis. The ulama, when he got with them, they said, you have to listen to their demands. They killed the monster, but they adopted his ideology of hate. And that what changed my country. Um, Saudi Arabia, we built, we have, we used the petrodollar to propagate to uh, this ideology of hate around the world. We built mosques, Islamic centers. We had all the Muslim uh, uh, families dream to send their kids for scholarship in the, in the, in the Islamist uh, uh, universities for free. Now you can see the radical Muslims in Indonesia. Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the world. It's the most peaceful. 
I've always remembered the Indonesian uh, pilgrims when they come to, to Mecca, they're very pure Muslims. Now you walk in Sumatra, uh, Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, women are wearing black and covering up. And like, what happened? We are now in Saudi Arabia pushing back radical Islam while we see it 20 years later after we, we, we broke from that. You see it around the world. It's really dangerous what happened. It took decades. To do that, but you in, in but you had your own experience, yes. right? So yes. in your own adolescence, you would hear the sermons, yes. you would listen to the teachers, yes. And I recall in the book, in particular, when you were first going to university, and you saw this whole new world, yes. And you sort of had this moment of saying, "I didn't realize there was another world." Yes. So uh, let me explain to you. I used to cover my face. I used to wear abaya by law. I was forced to do that in Saudi Arabia, black abaya took to talk. And uh, I used to burn my brother's cassettes. I, I found the picture of a singer in his wallet once. I showed it to dad, because that's haram. And dad kicked him out of the house. That was my radical years. The youth in Saudi Arabia were radicalized in the 80s and the 90s. I was one of them. We were preaching. I was giving these leaflets that called uh, hate against the non-Muslims, against the infidels, and discriminating between the woman who covers her face and the woman he doesn't cover, who, who doesn't cover her face as infidel. That is really dangerous idea to create us and them. I was one of these people. I was one of these project to be a terrorist, really. And that was the story of my generation. Some people really, they resisted, they did not uh, uh, but the pressure from the society around you was so huge to cover up, to be obedient, to walk next to the wall. They don't use your name. Mom would call me Muhammad, my brother's name. So I grow up that way. Even if I want to break out of that, the pressure is so high from your society to be obedient, to be quiet. And it's interesting. You live in the U.S., you have 50 states. Some states are really conservative. Some states are very liberal, like Massachusetts, the US, uh, New York, and then go to Utah, which is, this is not the US. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I have friends from Utah, so it's like, are you American? <laughs> <laughs> the whole idea is, in the same country, you find very conservative uh, parts of the country and very liberal parts of the country. For my surprise, the liberal part of my country was 80 kilos away. You, may, you make the math, I don't understand miles. Mm -hmm. But it, it was Jeddah, and that's when I studied college. And that's when the questions came up. So I meet these girls. In college, we don't wear the abaya, we don't wear it, because we have separate campuses. And I see my teacher through the closed TV. I never talk to my teachers, who are men. They lecture the boys. We are in a different campus, and we see them through the TV. Um, so in that university, I see my girlfriends. We, they're, they're nice people. They do their prayers. They are kind. And then when we leave the university, when the cars come to pick us up, one of my closest friends was uncovering her face. And that shook my beliefs. It took me a semester. I stopped talking to her because that, I'm like, she's, she's doing her prayer. She's giving sadaqa, which is charity. She's very kind to me. Why she's uncovering her face? That really shook my beliefs which is only, it's a city in, Mac in Saudi Arabia, why people there are different. They don't believe in the same version of Islam we have. That was the college experience. And that college experience led to your determination to succeed. Manal may not say this, but I can say this, because um, it's in her book, and you, sh you should know. She graduated top in her class in all of her educational experience. So her determination or your mother's commitment to your education um, was completely, um, you, you lived up to that expectation. Um, there's a line in her book that's so great where she sor sort of talks about being in college and sort of realizes, you know, I'm a bit of an activist, um, but you were an activist as a child. You were determined to succeed in school. You were determined to make trouble for your brother. You were determined, you know, your, your activism played many roles. Um, and then you had this great opportunity to go work at Aramco, the dream of many Saudis. The first woman to join the computer science department. On the, the information security. The infa information security department, a newly created department. Manal had first an internship and then was offered an opportunity. 
let's talk about Aramco. There are things I didn't mention in the book. So when I applied, uh, my, my girlfriend, we were 60 girls in computer science. So let me tell you something about computer science. My cousin is here, she's also in the same, we graduated from the same college. 1,500 girls applied for the acceptance. Uh, you have to do acceptance exam to, be, to apply for computer science. I didn't apply. I was physics, and I walk in the class, and there were seven girls in the class. And I'm like, something is wrong. <laughs> so I, I take my transcript, and I go to the computer science. Uh, the head herself was really brave. They kicked me out. I insisted to meet her in person. And I said, I want to join your, uh, your, college. your college, your department. And the secretary, she's like, no, 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 she's not joining us. Well, she, it's, we already passed the acceptance. And the, 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 the department head, she looked at my transcript, and I was five out of five, my GPA, five out of five, five. And she said, I want her. But she didn't do the acceptance, I want her. And 60 girls, 200, I think, we were accepted, and only 60 girls made it. Two girls got a job. So they, my cousin, she's doing her PhD. All her sisters are doing their PhD. Five, five ladies in the same house doing their PhD. We have more girls in high education than boys in Saudi Arabia because we don't have jobs. So I finished my bachelor degree, I don't find a job. To my surprise, my friend who worked in Aramco as a, an internship, I was complaining that I did internship, I didn't get receive money, she said, Aramco will pay you. I'm like, I, I, can't, I don't think dad will allow me to go. Because I was 23, but I still needed my dad's concept to go work. They did interview, my English was terrible, really. I learned it from Disney movies. Sesame Street. Yes. <laughs> she talks about Sesame Street. We, Sesame all, we Street. all learned English through Sesame Street. Yes. <laughs> Elmo. And <laughs> I can I can I can imitate Elmo. <laughs> and Ernie and Bert. Now I know they're gay. <laughs> Thank God they didn't find out. They would ban it in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> But I learned, my, I learned my English, and all the people who applied for that job, they learned in, Engl in American school. At that time, I was not allowed to study abroad as a, as a woman. And I was accepted. To my surprise, there were 38 men, and at the Smurfate, that was me, in the village of all Smurfies. And um, my boss, I remember he told me something later. It was very interesting, because my English was terrible, really. It was my Disney movie, Elmo English. And he said, <laughs> He said, when we did the interview, you were the best. We all agreed, and I didn't know why they really chose me. And they gave me, um, um, when, I, when I work there, uh, Saudi Arabia doesn't allow women and men to mix. So you cannot sit in the same room like this. Women should be behind uh, walls, so men cannot mix with them, cannot see them. Um, so my whole team, my whole department would go through training, and I would be deprived from that because I'm the only girl and they need a special permission from the Ministry of Interiors itself to be able to attend these classes. So I would just collect their books after they come back and I would study by myself and I would pass the same and get the same certificates. And I was the first one to get the title, which is Information Security Consultant at the age of 25 before anyone else who studied in the US who went to these classes. One of my classes, it was uh, ethical hacking. I was the first woman in Saudi Arabia to get the certificate. Ethical hacking. I'm an ethical hacker. <laughs> <laughs> ethical being the but operative ethical, word. Oh, ethical. Yeah. So, and um, they could not give me the class. And it, I had to do it in a, because you need a lab, you need computers. And they wouldn't allow me to go. And I couldn't do it just reading. I had to practice. And I insisted, I went online, I found all the classes out abroad, and I brought it to my boss, and I said, I'm going. And he said, we're not sending you. I'm like, I want to get my certificate, because that what stops between me and the title. They had to hire the teacher. It was me and the teacher alone like this, in a class for five days, with two laptops, and I got the certificate, and I got the title, before everyone else. I was also the first, thank you. <laughs> I was also the first CICSP, if you are in technology, CICSP is the highest uh, certificate any information security consultant would get. Yeah, is here, hi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of friendly faces. 
Um, and also uh, the, the first woman worldwide, not only in Saudi Arabia, to get the ISO uh, lead uh, auditor and lead implementer. It was a new certificate, and we were the first to get it in Saudi Arabia, the training, and I passed. And that was huge. And the newspaper wrote about me at that time. They, my husband, I was married at that time. He didn't allow me to post my photo without uh, my photo in those. But it was really liberating, the feeling of being the only woman there and facing all this discrimination. When I, when I joined Aramco, I was not allowed to live in the community. Mm -hmm. So Aramco had housing. I was, men, Saudi men can live in that community. non Saudis, women and men can live in that community. Only me, Saudi women cannot live in that community. At the same time, the, gov the government won't allow me to rent apartment outside. They won't allow me to rent a hotel room. They had to book the hotel room under the a man, and I have to sneak to my hotel room and make no sound. So they don't find out there is a woman single living, uh, staying in this hotel room. So I was, there is a chapter about it. I was employed, but homeless. And I couldn't tell my family because they will send me back home to be living alone in the city. There were a lot of obstacles. It was like someone cut your hand and feet and didn't even give you a, a wheelchair. So uh, it was challenging, and at the same time, it was liberating because I had to do everything on my own. I didn't have my father there. It, it, there is a lot in the chapter about Ramco <laughs> uh, that you can go through. Getting to work was your first struggle. So when she finally was able to rent an apartment, with another woman working at Aramco, whose father signed the lease for the two of them. And, and they he had to go to the police, promising his girls will behave. We used to leave even a man's shoes outside our apartment, so the neighbors think there's a man living with us in the house. So trouble wouldn't be caused. Um, we made it. <laughs> and they tried to get to work. And the story about the bus. So discrimination, Aramco is an American company, by the way, started in, the 30, in 32 by, te uh, I think, Texaco it was. Um, and it's very interesting that this American company inherited a lot of discrimination laws against women. One of them was they had the bus, the city bus. I was not allowed to ride the city bus to my work. And it was passing by my house because it was a woman. So I cannot drive. There are no public transportation. And I cannot even ride the company's bus. It was just like all the rules made to make my life not simple to make me fail, not succeed. And that's sort of how your determination to drive yes. started. Yes. Uh, we had to buy a car. We had to hire a driver. We had to teach the driver how to, to, drive. to drive. Yes. <laughs> I taught a man how to drive first. And we had to put up also with his smell. We had to buy him the shampoo and everything. And he didn't speak Arabic. I had to learn order to speak with him. It was a big challenge. So. And I don't think this is my story only. It's a story that shared amongst a lot of moments. But uh, what I choose, I could have just surrender and go back to my father's house. But I insisted that I will find every single obstacle they put in my way. I'll find a way to remove that obstacle and continue. So, Manal truly serves as the voice for so many voiceless. And I want to talk about your driving campaign. In the story, when you buy the book, um, there, is a, there, is a, there is a narrative about her marriage. Um, I don't think we'll spend time talking about the marriage today. So buy the book, you will find out. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we, we, we could, um, but this is about you, right? Um, the marriage wasn't a pretty experience although you got your son. You have a beautiful son who you reference and talk so brilliantly about. Um, and so there are gifts bestowed by so many things, right? So silver linings are very important. Um, but your determination to drive and to succeed is the thing that I think, um, as was shared in one of the reviews today by Oprah, you stand as the Rosa Parks of Saudi Arabia. And so let's talk about what your determination to drive was about and how it happened um, and the role your brother played. It's amazing how we changed. I changed. I kicked my brother out of the house because of that photo one day only. But 
how we all change, we, we all grow up. My dad, my mom, me, myself, and my brother. Um, my brother was the one who gave me his car keys, and I asked him, can we pass, I want to pass by a police car, because I want to know the authorities' uh, reaction to women driving. So it was 2012, I mean 11, and it was the Arab Spring going on around, and I saw the youth around the Arab world using social media. You use it here to connect with friends. My friend Daniel, I use his line, Arabs use it to start revolutions. <laughs> I love that line. <laughs> Makes me look smart. <laughs> and it's true, they use social media in very smart, unusual ways to call for change because we live in tyrannies. Saudi Arabia is one of the, it's called worst of the worst by Freedom House. One of the top, the worst 10 tyrannies in the world. This us, your allies, look, your allies. Uh, Saudi Arabia is one, it ranks 141st out of 144. All Yemen, Syria, and Pakistan, although I disbelieve they are under Saudi Arabia in the ranking, on the, the global gender gap index. And by the way, the three countries under us, they had prime ministers and ministers in their governments. We didn't, we never had. So the Arab Spring, when it started, I thought, oh my God, we can use social media to call for change. My personal struggle with the company, I always fought it silently, like within, writing petitions and talking to, and nothing changed. But the driving was a personal struggle for me because one day I almost got kidnapped from the street. And I had a car, I paid the installment five years, I was a good girl, I was paying the bank every single month out of my salary for five years. And I had to drive a license. I got a driver license when I worked here in 2009 from the state of live free or die. And that driver license, I got it at the age of 30. I was 32 that day when I almost got kidnapped and it was so frustrated. I have a driver license in my wallet and I have a car parked in front of my house and I cannot, as an adult, I cannot drive it. When the Arab Spring happened and the social media, the idea was simple. We call it day of action and we post videos to show that women can drive in public. And what really empowered this idea, my colleague, when I was complaining to him, he said, there is no law, there's no actual law that prevents you. I'm like, no way. And he sent me the law, and I go through the, the traffic police. It, does, it doesn't specify the gender. But I understand why it doesn't specify the gender in the Saudi laws, because we're no one, we're still minors. The law doesn't look at us as legal. Uh, that really sparked the whole movement, uh, June 17 movement, which is in four days, the, the sixth anniversary. So you uncover that there's no statue, no code, other than custom, where women shouldn't drive. And you decide, I'm going to do this. So you get in your brother's car with your brother. That was the, the second time. That was the second time. Yeah. The first time was... So the first time I, I drove with Wajih al Huedir, Right. And uh, I asked her to film with her iPhone. That's and I posted right. it on YouTube. And it got 700,000 views in one day. One day. And that got me into so much trouble. I got so many <laughs> threats from the people. <laughs> and I got... I had to... Dis I had to even to disable the comments. Because it was so offensive. And I had phone calls at my office. Right. That you opened the, the hell's doors. I'm like, I just drove. There was... It was, it was trending on YouTube, and I have screenshots of that. I gave a, a YouTube uh, speech uh, in Madrid for YouTube uh, to talk about how important is social media. And I showed those screenshots. And I remember one guy from Australia was giving a comment because it was trending on YouTube that day. He said, why everyone is watching this video? It's just a woman driving. <laughs> <laughs> because I was speak, uh, speaking Arabic in that video. So it did, it did uh, uh, bring so much backlash. So I did not know the authority stayed quiet. We wanted to know what would be their reaction when the actual day of action happens. So I, I went again, my brother's car this time, and uh, I asked him to pass by a police car because I wanted to be arrested. <laughs> they did arrest me. and I went through interrogation. They released me. Uh, um, but I made sure when I signed the pledge promising never to drive on Saudi land again, and I was in the interrogation room and I was saying, is Aramco Saudi land? Because I drive in Aramco. <laughs> Aramco is a gated community, my company. And um, they said, I said, but it's not against the law. That was when I was signing, I was refusing to sign it. I said, it's not against the law. 
I had to make the authority say it against custom, urf, we call it in Arabic. For me, that was a, my biggest winning because I wanted an official statement says it's not against the law to drive. They came back to me after they released me at 2 a.m. the same night. I was sent to interrogation and they sent me to jail without trial, without, without nothing. I found just myself in the woman prison. And it says on my paper, driving while female. That was my crime. That was your crime. <laughs> Be careful. Female drivers are dangerous. The irony, um, as I've learned, was that as this was all happening, in your bag was the application. Manel had filled out a, a driver's app, an application to get her license because there was no rule that women couldn't drive. And so um, in, her, in her activist commitment, she was going to get a license. But before that ever happened, you were in jail. So the, you were in the prison. first interrogation, he said, but you didn't have a driver license. I showed him my, mass I, I had, uh, after my uh, New Hampshire driver license, I had another one, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Yeah. So I was showing him my Massachusetts driver license. I have a driver license. I was like, it should be Saudi. I have the application. <laughs> I was ready with the application. And he's just like, oh my God, this girl, she asked for trouble. Yes, keep your application. I had to sue them. I had to take them to the court in November the same year, 2011, for not issuing me a driver license because there is no law. It's not based on it. There is it's illegal not to issue me a driver license because there's no law banning me. They send it to a special committee. Any tyranny would do that. But so, so I, before that happens, you do go to prison, and the only way you get out is your father going to ask pardon from the king. Imagine uh, living in a tribal society, Pocahontas, and <laughs> when you go meet the king, <laughs> something like that. So. I still defer to Disney movies. It's very beautifully written in here. Thank I you. Will admit. But I, th I don't think it's only dad going to the king. So when I was in jail, when you yeah. are sent, when they come to you at 2 a.m., it's only two cases in Saudi Arabia. Either you are a terrorist or you're a national security for driving a car. So I knew that no one will hear about me. I will just disappear. I made sure to call Ahmed, the one who was responsible for our Twitter. When I was, when I, when I, when I found, before they took me from the house, I called the CNN reporter. I woke her up, it was 3 a.m. when I called her. She was in UK. And I said, there are secret police outside. I have no clue who they are. They're taking me, please write about it. Because I don't know what's gonna happen next, if I'm gonna have access to my phone. When I was in jail, I was allowed, after a lot of begging, I was allowed one call. And I called the Twitter guy and I said, tweet about it. Actually, I called my, my sister-in-law yeah. and I said, tell Ahmed to tweet about it. And she's like, what is tweeting? Yeah. I said, just tell him to tweet about it. <laughs> I'm in prison. I'm the woman in prison. I think those two things, that CNN and also tweeting about it, this is the importance of social media, um, exposed the violation against my right that was sent to jail for driving. And I, when I was in jail, I was really disconnected from the world. I didn't know what was going, ha was happening. Mm. Uh, the page was brought down. Uh, the girls, dis our, our group disappeared. Everyone disappeared. The day of action. No, no. The day of happened. action happened. After, I'll tell you the story. So when I was there, I was there for nine days. And the international media went fren into frenzy. Everyone talked about it. I remember one blogger, one Saudi blogger, he pulled news blocks with all languages, Tamil languages, Indian languages, Japanese languages, Chinese, you name it. Everyone talked about <laughs> that woman who was sent to jail for driving. When I met my, my husband, my second husband family in Brazil in 2012, they knew me before he introduced me. <laughs> we read your story. Mm. That was amazing. So when I was in jail, there was international rally to release me, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, they, all of them talked about it. So the, the kingdom was in so much pressure to just let me out. But at the same time, as a monarchy, you have your, you cannot allow these Tradition. things to happen, this civil disobedience to happen. My father had to go with the chief of the family to the king himself in the palace to ask for pardon for his girl who was very bad and she drove a car in the city. <laughs> and that's when I was released. So you then go back to work things become more complicated at Aramco. And eventually, you move on. Come to today, 
I want to talk a little bit about what the world looks like today from your view, from your piece this weekend on your son who will be three this summer, who is unable to go with you back to Saudi Arabia, and your 12-year-old son who is unable to come be with you. Let's talk a little bit about, I want to talk first, I, I want you to continue to tell us about, so how does Islam progress? How does the role of women, five PhDs, five women PhDs, you, what I know of my tradition to not be any of these things. How do we, how does the role of women in Islam look to you today, right? What, what's, what's your responsibility? What's our responsibility? Um, what is your role as a mother in all of that? Um, so uh, if you ask about Islam as a Muslim woman, the good thing when you are a Muslim woman there's so many interpretation of the Islamic text that you can go through uh, because of the, it's widespread around the world. Before, I only had one version of the, the interpretation and it was so difficult. The more I'm trying to make, follow these rules, the more miserable I was. So the journey of finding out that there are other interpretation, there are other uh, uh, ways of looking to the text, the Islamic text of the Sharia law, that was really liberating to me. That's what I, I feel today, as Manal today. Uh, when it comes to Saudi Arabia, so Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned, is one of the worst when it comes to human rights. Absence of women's rights is nothing but absence of human rights. Point, period. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Saudi Arabia is one of the last standing mo absolute monarchies in the world. Saudi Arabia, uh, we don't have a written constitution. We don't have family laws written there. Men are deprived from their rights as us. The civil rights and the political rights. We're both deprived from that. So what we try to do today with uh, the social movement of change that we do, the, the trying to push for social change, is nothing but really boiling under the surface of we really need to do political change in the country where these uh, unjust laws ends. And that brings, I'm pretty sure, men in Saudi Arabia, they say, learn from the women, look how they fight for the right. <laughs> because they're very afraid, we're very fearless, I would say. Things are, do ch are, are, are changing. I have belief uh, in the new generation, the internet native, the ones who were born in the 90s, the millennia, they're amazing, they're really fearless. Uh, we, when we're brought up, you don't question, you cannot, we don't have critical thinking. Whatever I tell you is the final truth. They're different. They always ask why, and I love this about them. And I do believe uh, this generation, the 90 generations, are the ones are creating, pushing for real change in Saudi Arabia. Also, don't remember, don't, don't forget, we have the oil prices going down. We have the Yemen war going up, going in Saudi Arabia for the last two years, and this is the third. And that brings a lot of economical hardship to the government. So they cannot lock women, we're only 11%. The last, uh, the last statistic I did was 14% in the workforce, the women. I used to buy my underwear from a, a man, yes. This is how they want, they don't want women to work. That to the way that in a very conservative society, you go and buy, have you? How did you feel about it? There is a side lady here, when someone shows you your pants, this looks good on you. And I think this color is better. This is a society where it's so conservative to the way they don't want women to sell my own underwear just to don't give them that job and allow a man to drive me around separate, separation my whole life from men. I don't know men. I could fall off in love with the, with the driver because he's the only man I see. <laughs> <laughs> and so this contradiction that was happening with the economical hardship that we're facing today, they cannot. They allow the first thing, they allow women to work cashiers. And it's so sad to find a girl with a college degree working as a cashier, just because there are no other jobs for them. Now they don't have an option. It's not a luxury to keep to educate women, invest so much in women education, and then lock them home. And one of the things I believe that will create the change for women status today, the status quo of us, is driving. 
I have a lot of people contesting this, uh, my thought, and I'm like, no matter how I explain, you will not understand until it happens. And then you will understand why I'm insisting so much on driving. Susan B. Anthony, I was reading uh, one of her quotes, and it caught me. I'm like, she understands me, finally. <laughs> We're friends. <laughs> she says, she says, I've never seen anything emancipate women more than riding a bike. And there is a book called Wheel of Change, How Women Rode Bike to Freedom. Just remove bike and put a car. I made my point. <laughs> so this is, this is the one that, so the right to drive is really a, an act of civil disobedience, which is really obvious because you see women in the streets and that, really change something in the woman mind that she is not weak, she's strong, she's independent. She can be herself and it is emancipating. And there have been additional voices coming out of Saudi Arabia yes. saying women should drive. Yes. But then they get quieted once again. No, actually it's going better now. Okay. So six years of the dialogue uh, campaigning against the, the guardianship system um, and the, the domestic abuse uh, in Saudi Arabia, we faced a lot of, thankfully, um, I would say changing the culture, mm -hmm. uh, which is very important to start creating a push for the change. Mm -hmm. We succeeded in that. Um, I think the, the laws now, I mean, the lawmakers have no choice but to change the unjust law in Saudi Arabia, the unjust laws in Saudi Arabia. So why don't we open it up? There's a lot of opportunity to ask questions. I didn't ask about today's foreign policy work. Um, I'm sure there's some good questions to be asked about our the foreign policy. Is this recorded? Uh, the, the recent visit of our president to Saudi Arabia. But there are two questions. Why don't we start in the back? First here, and then we'll go to you, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, very, very, you're very uh, admirable in everything you're doing. Uh, I'm an attorney, so I have to ask a legal question. Uh. You said that men and women cannot mingle in the workforce or anywhere else, <clears throat> but it sounds like it's permissible to have a woman with a man who is not her husband in the car. I mean, they don't watch uh, teenage movies in America. I mean, that's, uh, that seems such an obvious uh, uh, argument to me as to why the whole argument, the, the whole system is silly that uh, you would uh, prohibit a woman from driving when, but allow her to be in a car with a, per a man who's not her husband. Okay, that's a contradiction. There is something Manal includes in the book, and you'll correct me, but it's a stat, um, a statistic about Uber and the, and the Saudi um, investment in Uber. What's the, what's the number? Three billion dollar investment. Yeah. It's three, right? It's three billion dollar Saudi Arabia investment. I can find it, but... I was so mad, I didn't even want to go through it's it. It's in the book. And 80% of Uber uh, uh, customers in Saudi Arabia are women. Because we didn't have, we came through the subway. And I'm like, I wish we can have subway in Saudi Arabia. <laughs> because I wouldn't need a driver. But we didn't have that, pop, that luxury of public transportation and pedestrian city. In New York, you walk everywhere. I cannot do this in, 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 in Saudi cities. How is it defined that the men can drive? It's just... Is, what's the justification? You can't drive, so a man has to drive you around. But to his question, is there no concern that there is a man there's in a the study, front seat? There is a study done by a professor. He says if the societies where women drive, they have more adultery, more illegal <laughs> children, more uh, prostitute than the societies where women drive. And there is another statistic, there is another actually statistic for the same professor. Um, respectable professor, he says, um, when, if you allow women to drive in Saudi Arabia after 10 years, there will be no more virgins. <laughs> I'm not kidding. That study was presented to the consultative council. It's like the Congress here. Well, our study was thrown. Was, that's, that's Saudi Arabia. Actually, there is also scientific reason for why women can't drive in Saudi Arabia. Yes, okay. scientifically proven that uh, driving hurts your ovaries. <laughs> hurts your ovaries. Ovaries. I'm sorry hurts for my ovaries. English. No, it's okay. Yes, there is a, a cleric who came. He said it's not religious anymore. It's now scientific. 
So our second question, and then we'll come right up here. You mentioned how Indonesia was becoming more conservative. Yeah. A lot of the conservatism of Pakistan, Indonesia, resulted from Saudi yeah. madrasas that were opened in those locations. Yes. How does Saudi Arabia become more liberal as in a world in which places like Indonesia, Pakistan, who are looking to Saudi Arabia as the center of their religious world, how, how does... How do the Saudis become more liberal in a world, in a Muslim world that's becoming more conservative? Uh, there are Saudi government and Saudi people, so we have to different. We're not the same. The Saudi government will always use Islam to keep its power. It's use it as po to keep its political power. Saudi society, we had enough really of all these strict rules that have been imposed on us, and we've said enough. The government is not really is not. Uh, uh, easing its grip on us, we're pushing. We're pushing them to, to ease it on us. But it's sad to see around the world, and it's inevitable, what happened, years of radicalization and indoctrination of the, the, the youth around the world, the Muslims around the world, done by, by petrodollar, because there was the Shia uprise and our uprise, and it was this competition between who dominates more the Muslim world, and we're paying the price today with radicalization the youth. So we are pushing against it. This is what's changing Saudi Arabia. The Muslims, the Muslim world took years of radicalization and it's happening today. So that, that, was, that didn't happen overnight. That's what's in the make for the last two decades. We have a question right up here and then some more. We'll go right back. Yeah, right here. I was in Aramco, which is a huge property. I don't think people realize how large it is. When you say Aramco, it's almost like Rhode Island. I mean, tremendous. And when I was there, the person's women could drive only in Aramco. So, so many, it was pathetic because when they went out, they were not permitted to drive. And I'm curious, is that still correct that uh, those who work in Aramco women are permitted to drive in that entire property and those same women are just not permitted outside of that. Yes. So there's no, no progress made, yes. whatever. This is why the question I ask when I signed, I would never, I promise never to drive on Saudi land. This is why when I ask the interrogator, is Aramco Saudi land? <laughs> because I was still driving in Aramco, which is true. There are a lot of, which is interesting, uh, I have a lot of expatriates, uh, uh, American friends who worked in Aramco, female ladies. I was so happy today. They were posting my book, and they said, finally, someone is speaking up against the discrimination that's happening to women, expatriate women and Saudi women in Aramco. Yes, nothing. And, and it's funny, in Aramco, they give uh, classes, defensive driving classes, and they give driving classes, but women cannot do that, and they still can drive. And I talked to my boss, and I'm like, they, they give us this one hour presentation about safe driving and defensive driving and hazards on the road. And I look at my boss, I said, this is hypocrisy because I'm hazard because I don't have a driver license and I'm driving and I cannot, I'm driving in the compound and I cannot go to these defensive driving classes and you're lecturing me about it, but I cannot go to it. And then if I, I do, a, 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 I have an accident, you blame me. You, you didn't even allow me to go to these classes. So the hypocrisy is really tearing. Yeah, yeah. I know Aramco will hate me <laughs> so much when this book comes out. <laughs> so right now, yeah, and then we'll go right behind you. I was in Arabia in 19, oh, if, you, if I tell you the, the time, you'll know my age. Anyway, <laughs> on, uh, with working with NBC International, putting the television station, okay? And everything you say, it's all right. I couldn't buy any clothes. I couldn't do anything. Did you buy your underwear from a guy? Uh, no. The she knows the feeling. <laughs> no, the, the, the driver, the Zibania was taking me to buy my underwear when my husband said, well, that's my wife. You know, where are you going? Yeah. You know, so it's 
funny when you send the husband to buy your underwear. <laughs> listen, the television station that uh, NBC was putting on, my husband said, i never seen anything like that before. Every time a woman comes in that show, we have to cut it up. Every time a little girl passed by, we have to cut it up. It wasn't an easy job was, for them. It was in the 80s. So in the 80s, they banned, after the uprise, the 79 uprise, yep. they had to ban women from sh being, even women presenters, they couldn't be, uh, they can't work on TV. Okay, but it was uh, 1964. Oh, so it was okay. That's when the, when the TV started. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was easing through the 70s, and then it went back again. Oh, um, and and um, the interesting thing, um, when they opened the channel, the TV channel, they went, they attacked it. Yeah. And they, 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 had, to bring, they had to bring a tank yeah. to protect it from the protesters. I used to live five kilometers from your... From, from the Me Mecca. Oh, from oh. Mecca. From Mecca, yeah. and you know, that's Jeddah. Yeah. Jeddah. So, that's, that's okay, I was so <laughs> interested to come and see you. I said, a woman from Saudi Arabia? Thank Arabian? you. <laughs> oh my God. We're delighted you're here. <laughs> right behind. There are more coming, be careful. <laughs> we won't be, n no need for anyone to fear. <laughs> so come Hi. with your spirit, <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be perfect. It's been a real pleasure to listen to you. Um, I've actually been in um, Saudi Arabia a number of times for my work. Who been here in Saudi Arabia <laughs> other than these two ladies, three ladies? <laughs> Interesting. So I've, I always had to, of course, wear the abaya, but I had to be more strategic because I could blend in and then sort of look like a bad Saudi woman, so I had to look like a respectful <laughs> Westerner That's and not cross the line because I could sort of be mistaken. Um, so my question is because in the conversations that I've had, and obviously when I go there, I spend most of my time with women. The meetings that I attend are always illegal. I'm actually illegally in those What was meetings. illegal? Being in meetings with men, which I have to do, oh, yes. but yes. technically it's illegal. Until today, by the way. Because there's in no public, separate yes. entrance and yes. all of that. So I spend most of my time with women and a lot of the conversation there, especially amongst this younger generation that you're talking about, are two things. One, that they actually see Islam as the liberating force and they're seeing the distinction between Saudi custom and Islam. And then the other thing, because there have been new sectors in the economy open for women, like now lingerie in my industry, which is a beauty. Um, and there's a thought that rather than take the human rights approach, just let the discrimination collapse because it's not economically sustainable, which you mentioned a little bit. And some of these younger women, even though they were feeling um, like they wanted to make the statement about women's rights, they thought that it might actually be easier to let it collapse because of economics, because then it wouldn't be a religious It's, it's more complicated, so there are so many... So your thoughts. There are many things happening that's leading to the collapse. You're done. I, I'm paying attention to questions. No, because it was, a comment. it was a comment. It was a valid okay. comment. So, so we have two, we're gonna, one okay. question right here, and then we're gonna make our way right up here. Um, so, yeah. Could you comment on two aspects of Saudi foreign affairs? One is, where do you see the increasingly bitter rivalry between Saudi Arabia and Iran heading? Where does that go? And the other is, because Bob mentioned it at the beginning, we have to circle back to the visit of the American president, and what effect do you think this might have, maybe none, on the incipient uh, social justice movements in Saudi Arabia that you've been involved in? That's a dangerous question. I'm flying back to Saudi. <laughs> Think, th right, think third, yeah, think thoughtfully. Mm -hmm. um, why don't we talk a little bit about um, the question on what will, your first question um, around the relationship between Saudi and Iran, sort of what does that look like in the next five years in your opinion? I, I really don't have answer to this question because okay. you never understand that now they're boycotting 
Qatar, which is there are brothers and sisters. You never understand what right now it's very, I would say, confusing to us, even Saudis and people from the Gulf. What is happening up there with all this um, hate against Qatar? And um, the hate against Iran been always there. But for us, it's confusing. The foreign policy of Saudi Arabia is really confusing. Do you understand what's happening now? Thank you. I've read all the, the analysis. I'm like, what is going on? These people hate these people, but these people are the friends of the people we... Like, what's going on here, especially in the Syria? It shows really the Iran and Saudi Arabia yeah. fight for power or competition yeah. for power in the Syrian conflict. Yeah. And for us, we're confused. What is going on here? Um, also, uh, let's talk about what is the Saudi population's reaction to Trump? I mean, he said nothing kind about any Muslim. His actions have been even more hurtful. And now he goes to your homeland. And dances are given, his, the highest honors are bestowed. What does the society, right? So the difference between the government and the people, what do the people think? I'm sorry to say this. You said expectation? We had no expectation. For God's sake, it's Trump. <laughs> this is a first. And I always say, the, what is more dangerous than, uh, than uh, dictatorship? What is more dangerous than a dictatorship? The illusion of democracy. That's why Trump is here today. And I'm sorry, my friends, they were crying when Trump made it. I was happy, you know why? Because I said, now this is your moment of truth. Trump will be the breaking point, point the peace and peace. And, and I'm Arab. <laughs> we say Trump. We don't say Trump. There's no P in Arabic. Yes. So everything's a B. So it's Trump. Mm. Yes. Mm. So Trump. <laughs> so Trump, you will see this country in the next four years. You will see more art. You will see more activism. You will see more people speaking up. You will see more people who've been neglecting uh, participating in, in, in the democracy. You will see them leaving their seats and standing for the rights. Trump is really important because sometimes if you don't use your democracy, you lose it. And this is what's happening. This is why he's here today. To make us question, to make us to listen to the voiceless who've been always talking, who've been always complaining, and we just shut they don't understand. They're so stupid. Those people in Alabama or whatever. But we understand the foreign policy. I think this is the moment of truth to America where things will really change to the better because you have someone that challenged those beliefs that you have. We did not have expectation from Trump. End of the story. <laughs> so we have one last question. Um, young man here in green. Thank you so much. Hello. Hello. Um, so full disclosure, Manal and I have <clears throat> known each other for five years now. And I don't want to make this too personal, but the way in which we knew each other was by way of me introducing Manal to David Keyes. And David is this Keyes, for and David Israel? Keyes, as a matter of fact, worked with Bob Bernstein. And together, we all met Bob Bernstein together in, in his The book office. was Bob's idea. <laughs> and, and, and now I find myself coming full circle because you and David did not get along. And I almost brokered a peace between the two. I still love David, don't I worry. And we're going to his wedding this, this Friday, as a matter of fact. But now, now that I've, I've been sharing your, 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 the, the stories of your book coming out online, now I'm finding that your critics are not the American Israeli Jews, but they're other Saudi women. I, I just got a text message from a friend of mine who said, Daniel, I must tell you what's on my mind, that, 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 that Manal, that, that the, the Saudi women were going to get their rights anyway, and that, and that she shouldn't have spoken up and so now, and it's fascinating because you see that the, the conflicts are not always what they seem. It's, it wasn't necessarily between the American Jews and the Saudi Muslims, but now it's, it, there's, all, there's now an internal discussion going on. Uh, so I wanted to ask you to reflect on what effect do you think your book is going to have in Saudi Arabia? And how is this going to change the discourse? What are you expecting when you throw this 
stone into the pond, so to speak. So how I wrote the book, I met Daniel by mistake. I didn't know who was Daniel, I had to Google his name before I met him. And Daniel introduced me to David Keyes, and David Keyes introduced me to Robert. And I met him in the office, and he said, you should write a book. And Robert, uh, and then David Keyes introduced me to my agent, Peter, who is here, Peter Pinnestan. And this is how the book came to existence. Um, I've been always questioned from the first day, which is very healthy to have opponents, because we need I don't, if I, I, if I want to hear myself talking, I would buy a, 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 a tape, I mean, a, a voice recorder, and I would tape myself and hear myself back. It's very important to have this woman to question, to challenge. It's really important to have the other side. And this is what you also need here in the US, to have the opponents, the Trump people, or the people who voted Trump to be in the office today. Um, and I listen to everyone, and it's very important I listen to everyone. but. You cannot change your belief based on other people's opinions. You, 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 you will listen, you will respect, and you will continue. And, and this is what I believe. Um, the book was supposed to be in Arabic. No publisher wanted it in Arabic. They said it's controversial, it's very dangerous. We will be banned from the most important market in the area, which is the, the Gulf market, the rich states. Now they have the courage to take my book and translate it. I, I wrote it in Arabic, translated it to English. <laughs> now it will change a lot. Now I have to translate it back to Arabic. And I, I'm, I believe it will make, it will give hope to the women in Saudi Arabia. The women who did not have the courage to speak up, they found one person who had the courage who said, enough writing princess books about me, enough writing about me in the third person. I'm coming out, I'm telling my story. I live in a country with high walls and closed windows. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm here, I'm out, I'm not ashamed of being a woman and I'm speaking up. Thank you. Uh, we actually planned this. We, we actually didn't. <laughs> so, so what an extraordinary ending to an extraordinary conversation. Um, please join me again in thanking Manel for joining Thank us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.